closed. Good evening and welcome to tonight's program on all you need to know about the brown tail moth and emerald ash borer with entomologist Tom Schmelk from the Maine Forest Service. I'm Brenda Harrington, program librarian at the Belfast Free Library, and I want to thank you all for joining us. I also want to thank our co-sponsors tonight, the Belfast Bay Watershed Coalition, the Belfast Garden Club, Friends of Belfast Parks, Friends of Sears Island, and the All of Belfast Climate Dialogues Project. Please keep your mics muted during the program and you are welcome to turn your video off as well. The program will be recorded and uploaded to the Belfast Free Library's YouTube channel. We'll have a Q&A at the end, so please put your questions in the chat and we'll get to them at, at that time. Now I'd like to turn the mic over to Tom King, board member from the Belfast Bay Watershed Coalition to introduce tonight's speaker. All right, Tom. Thank you, everybody. Thank you Brenda, for that introduction. And as you heard, Tom is from the Department of Forestry, Maine Department of Forestry. He's an entomologist with them. I think he's, he is uh, specializing in disease and invasive species. I'm sure Tom will correct me if I'm wrong. But before we get to Tom, I just want to give everybody a quick update of what's going on with BBWC here in February. And you uh, might be able to enjoy some of the things we have. Uh, <clears throat> first on the list is like February 8th, that's like Saturday, we have our bird watch, our harbor bird watch from 8.30 to 10 or 10.30, uh, dress warm, and uh, it's down on the footbridge. We have two very active birders there, Ron Harold and Gary Galisi, and uh, they, they set up with their scopes and they have binoculars and if you want to know anything about Burton, these are the two guys. Um, our next program, BBWC will have another program this month. That'll be February 17th. And it will be on a Tuesday night with um, Stephanie Watson, who will be talking about Maine offshore wind initiatives. And uh, this has uh, been established, of course, by Governor Mills. So, there's a lot of, lot of information that needs to be, you know, thrown out about this and chewed on. And there's a lot of information going around. Here's a, a chance to really talk to somebody that knows where uh, Governor Mills stands and the state stands on this. So, and uh, Saturday, February 19th, you know what? <clears throat> I'm sorry, that program isn't Tuesday the 17th. It's Thursday the 17th. Uh, I apologize for that. But um, Saturday, February 19th, Chloe Chan will take a, a group of, you know, a dozen people, first come, first serve, on a ski and snowshoe on Coastal Mountain Land Trust out in Swanville area. So uh, give Chloe a ring at 338-1147 if you're interested. And once again, make sure you dress warm because it will be a, an excursion. Be, before we go, um, we do have a, a couple things that are in the works with BBWC. And once again, we're going to go ahead and have the Penn Bay Stewards Program this spring. And the committee is working together, working on putting it back together in the month of May and extending it maybe a little bit more into the summer. So uh, it should be it should be interesting. And the other thing the other issue that BBWC is working on is we're preparing an Earth Day celebration with uh, some of our partners again, <clears throat> and more will be forthcoming, but uh, please check our website on both of those programs and we will be able to, you'll be able to find more information about them. And before I close, I just wanna say thank you to all the people that rounded up for BBWC in January at the co-op. We really appreciate it. So thank you very much. And with that, Tom, it's your turn. Thank you, Tom. Uh, can you see that okay? Yes, yeah. yes. Cool. Okay, uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, 
So I'm Tom Schmalk. I'm one of the forest entomologists for the Maine Forest Service. And this program uh, tonight will be focused mostly on brown tail moth, um, but I'm also going to talk about emerald ash borer uh, towards the end. Uh, so we'll just start with the basics. So brown tail moth is a non-native moth originally from Europe, and it was introduced into Somerville, Massachusetts in 1897. Um, on some rose bushes that came into a florist shop that happened to be uh, near a railroad depot. And that'll come into play in a little, little while. Um, but it's been established in Maine since 1904. So by no means a new problem. Uh, we just happen to be in the most recent and uh, severe outbreak. Um, it is also related to spongy moth, formerly, formerly known as gypsy moth. And that will also come into play in a little bit. So this is brown tail moth's approximate native range. As you can see, it covers most of Western Europe here. Uh, this is important because I get asked a, a lot, do the cold winter temperatures kill uh, the brown tail moth in their webs? And unfortunately, the answer is no. So a uh, general rule, if you're at the same latitude around the globe, those areas typically experience a very similar climate. Uh, so that means that brown tail is already adapted to our coldest winters and our warmest summers because it's coming from an area that's sort of at the same latitude as we are here uh, in Maine. It is not a very picky eater, um, has a very wide host range. What we find it on uh, in Maine mostly is oak, uh, any fruit trees, and that includes uh, ornamental cherries and crab apples. Um, but also birch, uh, black cherry, elm, and, and poplar. And we do, technically, maple is on the host, uh, host list, but we don't really see it in maple too often unless there is spillover from oaks. Um, if the oaks have a really high population in them, there will be uh, some spillover into the maple. So there's a lot of very, <clears throat> there's a lot of hairy caterpillars in Maine, um, and I'll, some of them do make tents, uh, but probably the most distinguishing features uh, to tell brown tail apart from the others are these two hunter orange dots towards the tail end here. And then you'll notice that each body segment is flanked with these white marks on each segment. And those two features distinguish it from really any other caterpillar in Maine. But there is one, uh, I used to say that brown tail is the only caterpillar that has those two hunter orange dots, but there is one, one other, um, that's the white mark tussock moth. And you can see these two orange dots here. Um, although they look pretty different, uh, I always think white mark tussock moth looks a little bit more like a toothbrush um, than, than uh, actual brown tail moth here. Okay, uh, so going into the history, um, like I said, uh, it's been in the U.S. since 1897, and it's been established in Maine since 1904. Um, so brown tail is sort of uh, unique in that the caterpillars overwinter in these palm-sized winter webs. Um, so at the turn of the century, when brown tail first came on the scene and it was becoming a problem, uh, there are very, there's extensive efforts that were made in order to help curtail this pest species. And one of the things that they did was uh, clip the webs and, and burn them by the tens of thousands. So you can see here, this photo um, is this kid standing next to this huge pile of those palm-sized winter webs. Um, and I wouldn't even want to guess how many webs are in that one pile, but tens of thousands for sure. And uh, all these burlap sacks that are in the back of this truck are also filled with those winter webs um, due to those clipping efforts around the turn of the century. Um, so some of the other things that they did uh, to control brown tail is that there were large spray projects that were initiated. Uh, this chart down here is some of the stuff that they're spraying around the turn of the century. You can see as a uh, arsenate of lead, Bordeaux, Bordeaux lead, bug death, um, just some really kind of nasty chemicals. Um, one of the reasons why we have a higher incidence of bladder cancer in some areas of Maine um, is because of this chemical here, arsenate of lead. And that was sort of, many of these were, were general uh, insecticides. 
uh, and many of them are no longer available because we know the human health impacts, but then also the environmental impacts. Uh, people also cut down their apple trees since apple is a preferred host. Um, a lot of people that had old uh, unmanaged orchards, it was sort of serving as a reservoir. Um, this photo up here is a, at a farm school. And in addition to doing their every other year pruning of the apple trees, um, they're also teaching the students how to clip out the brown tail webs. Uh, so like I mentioned before, uh, 1897, this is Somerville, Massachusetts down here. Um, and this sort of light gray area here um, sort of shows the maximum extent of brown tail. And you can see within 17 years of its introduction, it sort of conquered all of New England and even parts of Southern Canada here. Uh, part of this is due to uh, Brantel's ability to hitchhike, um, and it's very, very good at that, and that's one of the ways that it spreads even today. Uh, <clears throat> I read this old, uh, old article from this paper in New Hampshire uh, in the 19-teens that implicated electric cars with moving uh, Brantel around, and yes, I did say electric cars. Um, electric was very popular before the uh, petroleum really took over as a power source for vehicles. Um, but yeah, just 14 years. Uh, so in the late teens, early 20s, there was a huge population collapse, and that was due to uh, a number of different factors, uh, uh, principally uh, the fungus and the virus that attacked brown tail, um, as well as the uh, wet spring weather um, that helped facilitate those two pathogens, but then there was also um, biocontrol agents that were released. So without getting too deep in the weeds here, um, so around the turn of the century, they did uh, release a bunch of parasitic flies and wasps that uh, attacked brown tail. Uh, what they used to do is they used to go over to Europe <clears throat> or the native range of any pest and basically uh, take anything that was attacking them over there and bring them over uh, over here without checking to see if they were specialists, if they attacked any of our native species. Um, the process is way, way, way different now. There's like a decades long uh, vetting process with these biocontrol agents, um, but that was not the case in the early 1900s or in the 1800s. Uh, so some years, Prior to brown tail coming on the scene, uh, spongy moth, previously known as gypsy moth, uh, was becoming a really bad pest in the 1870s. And they brought over um, a suite of, of these parasitic flies and wasps. A lot of them were generalists. And then uh, fast forward a few decades when brown tail comes on the scene, they made that jump over to brown tail and, and did help give some control, although they did attack some of our native species, unfortunately. Um, so, like I mentioned before, uh, in the late teens, early 20s, the population of brown tail experienced a really uh, large population decline due to those factors that I mentioned. Um, and it sort of fell back to coastal Maine and uh, some parts of New Hampshire. Um, and like any forest pest, brown tail moth has outbreaks um, and population booms and busts and sort of is cyclical in nature. So, uh, you know, we over in the 1900s, we had multiple outbreaks. Uh, last outbreak that we had was in the early 2000s. It was the total acreage uh, was not that much compared to what we have now. It's around 10 or 15,000 acres. Um, and now we're dealing with around uh, 200,000 acres. So the reason why we're talking about brown tail is because it, uh, the primary problem with it is that it is a human health nuisance. Um, rash is most common in June and July, and that's when the caterpillars are active and shedding the, their skins and the hairs are very prevalent in the environment. That's also when people are outside enjoying their yard, enjoying the weather, um, and coming to contact with those hairs. So the hairs are very tiny and uh, barbed and hollow and filled with a toxin. So not only are you getting the mechanical irritation from these barbs on the hair, but you're also getting that chemical irritant from the toxin. Um, 
So it says here that toxin is very stable and can last in the environment between one to three years. Uh, that's more typical of areas that are sheltered. So like under a deck, under a trailer, um, stuff that doesn't really get a whole lot of precipitation. Uh, place that in the woods, out in your yard that get rain and snow, um, that helps incorporate the hairs into the soil and they are uh, much less of an issue um, than versus those uh, dry areas I was talking about. Uh, so the secondary problem with brown tail is that it is a, a forest pest um, and it brown tail doesn't doesn't usually kill trees by itself. Um, usually there's other uh, pests th that are defoliating uh, the tree at the same time. So in coastal Maine, you have winter moth then you also have spongy moth, uh, formerly known as gypsy moth, sort of feeding on the same trees. Um, so all those pests coupled with um, with basically three years of drought um, really has stressed the trees out uh, a little bit more than they would typically be. Um, and we are starting to see some mortality um, throughout uh, the infested range of brown tail. Um, so one of the other questions I usually get is that, um, you know, how long will trees take all this defoliation? It sort of varies by site and by individual tree, um, but trees are very tolerant of defoliation, especially oaks, and they can last two, three years of being completely defoliated, and they will relief later on in, in July once the caterpillars have stopped feeding. Um, but that being said, there's other stressors like the drought and other species that are um, consuming them, so it might, uh, might weaken them a little bit more, unfortunately. Okay, so we'll get into identifying the different webs um, that you find typically find in Maine. Um, there are there's two or there's three um, species that that do make webs uh, that can be confused for brown tail. Um, so the first one that is probably the most confused for brown tail is fall webworm, and fall webworm is native. Uh, we typically see it in late summer on apple or cherry or walnut and ash. Um, so one of the key differences here is the size of the web. Uh, so that's my hand there. Uh, you can see it's about the size of a, a football. Uh, brown tail moth will never ever be any bigger than the palm of your hand. Uh, that's how big those winter webs will get. Um, so football size, and then also um, it's sort of basically you're, you'll go. You're going to want to look at the uh, the host tree. If it's in a walnut or an ash tree, it's definitely not brown tail, but probably the most telling characteristic is that size. Okay, so now we have uh, Eastern Tent Caterpillar. Eastern Tent Caterpillar is also native. Um, and there's two, two ways to just, or three ways to distinguish Eastern Tent Caterpillar from brown tail. Um, it's gonna be sort of a, a time of the year sort of thing. So Eastern Tent Caterpillar is building their webs in um, late spring, early summer. It, when brown tail is, um, you know, their webs are, are, are going to be very small. Um, <clears throat> Eastern tent caterpillar also builds a very large web about the size of a football again. And it's also a location thing. So you're going to, when you're looking at these webs, it, they're building their webs right where the branches meet the trunk. Um, and brown tail moth webs are always going to be on the very tips of the uh, vegetation. And again, a lot smaller than Eastern Tent Caterpillar. Okay, so this third one is a little bit more difficult. Um, so there's two species of our native silk moths that do create a web that's similar in size um, and on some of the same hosts that brown tail is on. So uh, Cercropia, which is pictured here, and um, Promethea moths, uh, uh, when they're caterpillars at, towards the end of the summer, they will uh, sort of spin this cocoon to overwinter in, and they will emerge as adults the following spring or summer. Um, so a couple of ways to tell the difference between brown tail and these native silk moths um, is if you, if you th think about it as it's a single, very large individual uh, that's in this um, cocoon here. So it's kind of like a little, um, coin purse sort of it's very it's it's just a bag it's not uh 
leaves that are sort of interwoven with silk and um, it's a much much cleaner looking nest basically. Um, also with brown tail moth, um, the fresh winter webs are gonna be very bright white. The silk's gonna be very um, vivid. Uh, and with these silk moth cocoons, uh, they sort of fade uh, pretty readily and are, are definitely more of a brownish color. Um, but yeah, they're about the same size and, and sometimes they're on the same host. So um, once you get to recognize what brown tail moth webs look like, uh, it's a pretty easy comparison. And speak of the devil, um, this is what brown tail moth winter webs look like. They are very variable um, and they can be comprised of a single leaf that uh, is silked over, but more often than not, they're gonna look uh, something similar to these two webs here. Um, so again, never, the, never bigger than the size of the palm of your hand. Um, and they're also going to be comprised of that fresh white silk that's sort of interwoven with um, a few leaves at the very tip of the branch. Um, and it's sort of a, a messier kind of web. Um, so inside each one of these palm sized webs is, is between 25 and 400 caterpillars. Um, so clipping each one out that you can reach is, um, is a really, really good thing to do. Um, so a very common site in most of uh, most of Maine. I used to say just coastal Maine, but it's definitely uh, definitely inland in Kennebec County and, and beyond. Um, so one of the things that is very important to do, especially in night, fr nice bright sunny days like it was today, is go out into your yard and stand with the sun to your back and look up at the tops of the trees, paying particular attention to oaks and cherry elm, poplar, uh, fruit trees in your front yard, um, you'll be able to see where the winter webs are um, and they'll sort of shine a white, uh, whitish silver color in the sunlight. Um, it's very, very apparent as you can see from this photo and it's even more apparent when you're looking at it um, with your own eyes. Um, driving around, I see a lot of people, um, I see a lot of people with, you know, crab apple trees or apple trees or cherry trees in their front yard that have tons and tons of webs in them. Um, and I try to pull over and uh, knock on as many doors as I can, but unfortunately I can't reach everybody. Um, so if you do see your neighbor's fruit tree that has some webs in it, please let them know that they can uh, definitely clip those out and save themselves some trouble for the following season. So I said there's 25 to 400 caterpillars per web. Um, so this is a web that I took in a couple of winters ago and had it in the lab. And each one of these little uh, brown sprinkles is a caterpillar. And this is just from one web. Um, so just sort of to drive home the point that every web that you can get and clip, um, you'll be doing yourself a world of good. Um, so in order to sort of condense this, um, this presentation and to fit emerald ash borer and I did have to cut out a lot of uh, material and one of the things I cut out was a lot of the life cycle. Um, this is a summarized life cycle here. It's available on the website. Um, if you just type in brown tail moth uh, life cycle, it, it should come up if you need to look at this later. Um, but the main takeaway home message here is that the highest risk exposure for hares is from mid-April through July. And that's when the caterpillars are um, large and active and feeding and sort of wandering around, shedding their skin. Um, so there's a lot of hairs in the environment and there's also a lot of people out enjoying um, or trying to enjoy their yard. Okay, so current situation in Maine um, has continued to expand its range, unfortunately. So this population outbreak that we're seeing now started in 2015 and we've sort of been seeing a market increase um, in, in the numbers over the past um, six, seven years now. Uh, so the mo most heavily impacted counties are uh, Anchorage, Kennebec, Knox, and Waldo. Um, you guys are sort of in the hotbed there, unfortunately. Um, so last year and between April and July, the call activity was very, very high. Um, well over 500 calls uh, that re we received here at the Maine Forest Service. Um, and that's not including the stuff from, uh, that was fielded by uh, 211 and Depart uh, 
Bureau of Ag, um, and the CDC and UMaine uh, extension. So a lot of calls, a lot of people inundated uh, with brown tail moth, unfortunately. Uh, so this year, so we fly two rounds of aerial survey each year, uh, one in the late spring, early summer, and then um, one in the late summer, early fall to pick up um, the, the damage from, from brown tail. So this year, grand total for both surveys was almost 200,000 acres. This is a, quite a bit of an increase since the last outbreak in the early 2000s, which was around 10,000 or to 15,000 acres. Um, and it's also a market increase from even last year when we had around 150,000 acres of defoliation. Um, yeah, so uh, sort of a worsening situation, unfortunately. So this is sort of what we see from the air uh, when we're doing aerial survey. And you can see here these sort of light brown patches are stands of oak trees that have been completely defoliated. And this is during that late spring, early summer um, survey. And so this is uh, right around Camden. And you can see this, this is the fog bank over the ocean. And this, as you well know, um, up in Belfast, uh, this was sort of up, up through the hills and quite a large area that was affected. Uh, so some of the good, uh, some good news from last year. So even though it was a drought um, and very hot and dry, uh, we did at some of our monitoring sites around the state, we did see um, some pathogen activity, uh, which is really good news. Um, so we weren't really expecting to see any, but we, we did see some at our monitoring sites and um, it was very widespread. So we saw the fungus and the virus up and all the way up in Blue Hill, down through Belfast, um, Liberty, Jefferson, among other towns. Um, and this is very encouraging because that means that if we get a normal spring, rainy spring um, in May and June, we're likely to see a region-wide population collapse. Um, the pathogens are there, they just really need that wet weather to explode and sort of spread uh, rapidly. Unfortunately, we are at the stage now where the population is so big that we it's possible that we might need two years in a row of normal uh, wet spring weather to really crash the population. Um, but we might get lucky and it might be a, a one and done. Um, I'm hoping for that, <laughs> that scenario. Uh, so this was over at my house and um, you can see this caterpillar here that's in a U shape is, um, that's a caterpillar that's affected with the virus. Um, and as you can see by these caterpillars that are sort of pupating underneath the house here, or underneath the siding, um, a lot of this pathogen activity happened sort of late in the season, and um, it wasn't enough to, to catch a lot of them. A lot of them did end up pupating and, and turning into moths, unfortunately. Uh, so we also saw some later season pathogen activity, which was also really great. Um, so these are, uh, these are right outside on the state campus here. And I was uh, going through and looking at the nests that are in the pin oaks out front here. Um, and I did see some uh, caterpillar mortality. So these are all uh, very small caterpillars that died on the outside of their web as they're creating that, that web to, to overwinter in. Um, and then here on, on some of those same webs, uh, this is a tachinid fly. So uh, Tachinidae is a, fam a very large family of flies and they're all parasitic on different arthropods. Um, and there are a few species that do attack brown tail, which is what this one was doing here. Um, so some good news. So last winter, um, so we do a, a winter web survey each year. And uh, in that winter web survey, our technicians drive the major roads uh, throughout the infested area and then uh, a buffer to catch range expansion and um, satellite populations. And um, to, that's ongoing currently, and we typically wrap that up um, in late March. But this area here circled is sort of where the main bulk of the population is in Maine. Um, but these two stars here represent where we found single satellite webs, um, which again is a testament to how well 
uh, brown tail moth can hitchhike and, and expand its range. So what likely happened was there were trucks passing through this uh, mid-coast region that stopped and accidentally picked up brown tail moth and brought it with them uh, up north, unfortunately. Um, and luckily, it was just uh, a single web in each case. But again, it sort of raises the alarm. Uh, so this is what that winter web survey data looks like. Um, so as we're driving these roads, we're estimating the number of webs uh, that we see per tree. Uh, it's definitely not perfect, but it does give us a very good idea um, about what, what next year is going to be like based on the number of webs. Um, so this is last year's survey, so last winter survey. Um, and it, you can see if the, uh, the hotter the color, the more webs per tree there are. Um, and you can see here, there's a lot of yellow and orange and a lot of red up in here. Um, so definitely sort of the hotbed, unfortunately. Okay, so like I mentioned before, cold winter temperatures do not kill brown tail moth, um, but cool wet springs do, and that allows the fungus and the virus to really spread and proliferate and really knock out brown tail. Uh, so we'll move into management here, and I will stress that the most important and the first step in management is education. Um, that's one of the reasons why I do so many of these informational sessions is just to bring awareness and um, sort of try to disseminate as much information as I, I can. Uh, so brown tail moth, or so this is the first day of uh, brown tail moth awareness month. Um, official signed by the governor. Um, and one of the reasons that we have chosen February for uh, Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month is because it's an excellent time of year to go out and um, see what brown tail is doing in your yard. Um, web, uh, the webs are very visible because the leaves are off the trees, so you can see them pretty readily. Uh, the hair activity is very low, uh, so you have lower risk of coming to uh, a breakout in a rash. Um, and then you're also, when you clip webs, there's no non-target side effects. You're just getting the brown tail in their nest um, before they cause any damage. Um, so different ways to get the community involved are web clipping events. Uh, so these two photos here are from uh, web clipping events up in Deer Isle. Deer Isle has been sort of um, a role model as far as these community events are concerned. Uh, Blue Hill Heritage Trust and Island Heritage Trust have uh, gotten together and, and sort of sponsored some of these web clipping events. Um, and a lot of people turn out. It's always a good time. And we're doing, you know, really good work and also raising awareness at the same time. Um, yeah, so community, um, one of the things we were sort of hoping to spark is some community competition, some friendly community competition town versus town, who can clip more webs. Um, and this is some stuff that they used to do at the turn of the century um, uh, when Brattel was, was first on the scene. OK. Uh, so important notes about uh, clipping winter webs. Um, so winter is the preferred time of year um, at, for those reasons that I mentioned before. Um, when you clip the webs out, uh, you're going to want to make sure that you pick them up and destroy them. Uh, if you leave the webs on the ground, caterpillars are very good at finding food and they will just crawl back up on the host tree. Um, and when you do clip them out, uh, you can destroy them a couple of different ways. You can soak them in a bucket of soapy water overnight and that should kill them. Um, or you can burn them is another good option. You're going to want to do all of this before mid-April. Mid-April is when they reemerge and begin feeding again. Um, so try to do it now or, or sometime in March. Okay, so as far as chemical control goes, um, I always say clip first, spray last. If you can, I realize that uh, some of these trees are very, very tall, especially the mature oaks along the coast, um, but try to get the, the webs out of the, the low hanging uh, fruit trees. So, if you do decide that you want to go the chemical control route, um, make sure that you are listening to the laws and uh, or if you are hiring somebody, hire a licensed applicator. 
uh, and you're going to want to do the treatments before the end of May. Um, most of most of treatments, either mechanical clipping or chemical treatment, are focused on relieving uh, or focused on mitigating people coming into contact with the hairs. Um, so if you spray later, yes, you will be killing the caterpillars, but there will still be a bunch of large caterpillar bodies in your yard with those associated hairs. Um, if money uh, is a deciding factor, which it is for uh, most people, myself included, um, basically you're going to want to try to focus on trees that are in, in heavily trafficked areas, like overhanging your house, overhanging your deck. Um, don't worry too much about the trees that are further away from the house. Um, like I said, most of this uh, most of this management is revolves around mitigating people coming into contact with the hairs. Uh, and once one last slide on brown tail um, with the tree injections, we get a lot of questions about tree injections. That was basically half the questions that we were getting. And we have revised our frequently asked questions website and added a bunch of questions, including a bunch on uh, tree injections. So you might want to check that out. A lot of great information. Um, spent a lot of time building that, and it's in a easily digestible format. Um, so the mo most common ingredient that people inject for brown tail is called acephate, um, sold under a bunch of different brand names, but the active ingredient acephate is, is very effective. Um, so you, when you do these injections, you're going to want to time it with when the tree is moving water and nutrients. So it uptakes these in, insecticides, which is typically around bud burst. Um, again, focus trees on focus on trees in high traffic areas. You're not going to be doing a woodlot or trees that are further away from the house with tree injections necessarily. Um, they're uh, a little bit more on the expensive side and for, for good reason. Uh, you can do them yourself, but we I implore you to follow the instructions word for word. Um, there is a lot of user error um, if the, these instructions aren't followed. Um, and then also before you buy stuff online, you're gonna wanna make sure that it is registered for use in the state and the Board of Pesticide Control um, has a list of all the registered pesticides. And you can search by active ingredient for uh, brand names. Okay, so moving on to the second segment, which is emerald ash borer. Um, emerald ash borer was first found in Maine in 2018. Um, it, it, and simultaneously, it was found in the furthest south uh, in Maine and also the furthest north in Maine. The, so up north in Arusta County and Madawaska, um, it, that that infestation was sort of spillover from a Canadian uh, the infestation on the Canadian side of the river, and then conversely in York County, that uh, infestation was spillover from New Hampshire's infestation. Uh, so, just a little bit about the life cycle. Uh, so, the female uh, emerald ash borer will lay eggs on an ash tree. Larva will burrow in through the bark into that cambium layer, which is the living layer under the bark. Um, and feed on that cambium. And the life cycle can take between one to two years, depending on um, different factors, uh, but, but generally between one to two years. And then uh, once the larva is mature, it pupates and turns into an adult beetle and uh, chews its way out and creates this characteristic D-shaped exit hole. I will say they don't necessarily always look like uh, aren't always D-shaped, but um, it's a pretty good, pretty good characteristic. Um, so when the adults exit, they will fly away, mate, and look for other ash trees. Uh, so <clears throat> these points I already touched on, but uh, this is sort of what they're doing under the bark. Uh, all of these little galleries, so this tree was very, very heavily infested. Um, and you can see they basically girdle the tree by eating all the cambium, eating all that living layer. And there's basically, you couldn't even put a thumbtack in there without hitting a, a, a gallery. So why is emerald ash borer a problem? So uh, none of our native ash species are, are tolerant against emerald ash borer. So in Maine, we have uh, black or brown ash, green ash, and white ash. And none of those species are, are really tolerant towards uh, emerald ash borer. Um, 
most of the time when the trees get attacked, they will uh, succumb to, to the onslaught, unfortunately. Um, so emerald ash borer was first discovered in the United States in Michigan in 2002. Uh, into the US on some solid wood packing materials or pallets um, and began an infestation there. And there's been some recent research that have gone back to sort of the epicenter of where emerald ash borer was discovered. And uh, they've actually, they more think that it came over in the early 90s and sort of incubated for a while. One of the reasons why it wasn't detected for a long time is because there's a fungal disease of ash called ash yellows that has many of the same symptoms that uh, an, M, uh, an EAB infested tree will have. Um, so it, it wasn't discovered, it sort of flew under the radar until somebody actually uh, dissected one of these trees. Um, so there are a lot of industries that uh, rely on ash, um, all species of ash. So furniture and flooring, uh, tool making. So if you have an ax or a shovel, more, than, more likely than not, it has an ash handle to it, very strong, uh, very workable wood. Um, <clears throat> sports equipment, so if you have a wooden baseball bat, more often than not, again, that's gonna be an ash baseball bat. Um, but most importantly, um, there's a Native American basket making tradition that is centered around uh, brown or black ash um, that is very important culturally. <clears throat> and unfortunately, black and brown ash is the most acceptable species to emerald ash borer. It's the most preferred. Um, so <clears throat> in these traditions, they um, would will beat, beat these logs and the fibers on brown and black ash separate into these long thin strips that they can use for basket making. Um, and some of these baskets are very, very beautiful. Um, if you haven't checked them out, I, I would highly recommend that. Um, but it's a, a, you know, millennia old tradition that will possibly be lost um, because of uh, this introduced insect. So <clears throat> early detection is very difficult. Um, the larvae are under the bark and the trees don't really start producing symptoms until enough of that cambium layer has been eaten. Um, so I've been in forest health for over nine years now. I've never seen, I've only seen an emerald ash borer adult once, and that was in, in Ohio, very infested, um, open grown ash that had branches uh, way down. Um, I can almost guarantee you that you will never see an emerald ash borer adult. Um, more so than likely, you're going to see the, um, the galleries of the larva or the symptoms of the tree declining. Um, and one point is that uh, firewood is one of the most one of the leading causes of, of this spread of this uh, invasive species. Um, ash is very good firewood, splits really easy, nice and straight grained, um, and uh, there's a lot of ash trees that are dying. People cut them down, split them up, and they uh, go up to camp, bring the wood with them. Um, not a great idea. So all out of state firewood in Maine is illegal um, and it is for very, very good reason. Um, so not only emerald ash borer moves in firewood, um, but there's a whole host of other insects that do move in firewood as well as fungal pathogens like um, oak wilt, uh, which we don't have in Maine yet. And I, I hope it never comes to Maine. Um, but a lot, a lot of pests and pathogens that are present in firewood. So when people bring out of state firewood, um, they are directly <laughs> putting our, our forests and our forest resources um, in danger, unfortunately. Um, but that's, that's one of the reasons why we have that law. So recognizing some of the signs and symptoms of emerald ash borer in ash trees, uh, one of the major, uh, most prominent features is woodpecker activity. So after emerald ash borer has been in the area for a couple of years, um, the woodpeckers kind of key into the larva underneath the bark. Um, you can see here, this is one of those D-shaped exit holes. And right next to it is a, a woodpecker that went in there and, and got a larva out. Um, and it can be pretty dramatic. You can see here, this is uh, emerald ash borer gallery. It's very serpentine and S-shaped. Um, but when they rip, rip the bark off of those trees, it, um, 
it shows the underbark, which is this sort of blondish color. Um, and that's why we call it blonding. So in some areas, it can be very severe, basically from root to, to branch tip can be um, ripped off and, and blonded. And this is sort of what it looks like up close. You can see where the woodpeckers have gotten in there and um, removed the larva. So one of the other things, uh, one of the other signs and symptoms is thinning crowns. So anytime you see a tree that has a thinning crown, that usually means that something's up with its transportation, its water and nutrient transportation system, so it's xylem and phloem that are in that cambium layer. Um, so as the larva feed in the cambium, they sort of uh, girdle the tree and um, prevent it getting from getting water and nutrients, which in turn makes the canopy die and die back. Um, and one of the other things that uh, you'll see is something called epicormic shoots. So that's when the tree produces um, a mass of leaves straight out of the trunk. And that's also another sign that there's something wrong um, with its transportation system. So with the larval galleries, um, they're gonna be these S-shaped serpentine galleries. And um, there's nothing, nothing else in ash that's gonna make these galleries. None of our other native um, uh, jewel beetles, which uh, is the family for emerald ash borer, um, none of them are gonna make this S-shaped gallery, especially not in ash. Um, so very diagnostic and usually only see this uh, woodpecker activity. We'll go through and peel the bark back and, and usually what we see um, is, is some of these S-shaped galleries. And you can, again, you can see how uh, the densities will girdle a tree pretty quickly. Uh, so we do have another native ash borer. It's in a different family than emerald ash borer. Um, this is uh, called Neoclitus capria, and it's a longhorn beetle. Um, again, native. And one of the ways that you can tell the galleries of Neoclitus here from emerald ash borer is uh, they, basically the dead end and their Y shapes. And you can see they're quite different from um, these emerald ash borer galleries. Uh, and they sort of fork and, and come to dead ends. Uh, so this is, this is our native ash borer and, and not uh, emerald ash borer. Okay, so uh, sort of the most current information on emerald ash borer. Um, we haven't really had a whole lot of range expansion up in this northern boundary. This is sort of a close up of that northern quarantine zone. Um, but we unfortunately have had a quite a bit of um, range expansion and new finds down here in, in the southern part of this quarantine zone here. Um, and we, we definitely expect this to grow, um, but we're trying, trying to sort of slow the spread here. So one of the sort of silver linings of um, emerald ash borer is that we do have three um, biocontrol agents. So they're three very small species of wasps that each have a slightly different niche so uh, these three wasps are from uh, emerald ash borer's native range. Um, one attacks the eggs, one attacks the larva in young trees, and one attacks the larva in uh, older, more mature trees. Um, not, uh, so they've gone through that USDA vetting process and they don't bother any of our natives. Um, and, and they also do not sting. We get a lot of questions about um, do these wasps sting? They're very tiny and are not interested in humans at all. Um, they're not like the yellow jackets or, or paper wasps that you might have around your house. Um, so these are some of the release sites down in southern Maine. Um, and we have since retired uh, these two biocontrol sites up in uh, up near Madawaska. Um, the population sort of just needs to um, expand a little bit more for that for those biocontrol agents to really take off. Um, we're having a lot more success down here in, in Southern Maine. Uh, and with that, I will end and, and open it up for questions. Yes, we have lots of questions. Now, some of the questions came in the chat early on in your talk, and I feel like some of them were answered, but let's see. Um, somebody wanted to know, 
aside from going out, not going outside, what's the best way to protect your skin and respiratory system from the irritants of the hairs of the moth? Yeah, so if if you're going to be in, so I would recommend, if, especially if you're a more sensitive individual, um, trying not, maybe hiring somebody to do um, basic yard work, cleanup, um, spring cleanup, stuff like that. Um, but if you are going to be out there, um, wear long sleeves, wear gloves. Um, you, I, you can wear a mask if if you want. Um, we're we're all used to wearing masks at this point. Um, but it's generally it's more people getting the rash than respiratory issues. Obviously, there are certain there are definitely certain people that do get respiratory issues, but far more common to get the rash. Um, yeah, and, and when you come in from doing that yard work, um, sort of like the recommendation for ticks is you'll want to take that those clothes and throw them in, in the dryer at high heat and um, without washing them first, and that will, um, will help destroy some of the toxin if it's at high heat. Um, yeah, and so also the, to follow up with that, if the little hairs get in um, a person's vegetable garden in their vegetables, like let's say some lettuce, is that going to be a problem if you eat them? Uh, so that's a question we get a lot of as well. And um, I would say I, I've talked to the people at Humane Extension and um, all the common guidance is that you don't really have to worry about that too much. I, in my three and a half years at the Maine Forest Service, I've never heard of anybody uh, getting the rash in their mouth or, or having anything like that. Um, probably just wash the veggies before you eat them, um, but I don't think it should be an issue. Okay, great, thanks. So I think you answered this one. Somebody asked, um, is there a concern when you're clipping the webs out from getting the rash from the white parts of the web? And you just, I think you said not so much as long as you wear gloves. Yeah, the, the hair activity during the winter is very low. Um, Obviously, if it's a really infested area, there might be some residual hairs or, or shed skins still on the tree. Um, just wear gloves, wear long sleeves, um, and you should be fine. Uh, I had a question at one of my earlier talks today that was basically asking, um, you know, are the if you have respiratory issues, are the webs okay to burn? And I would say that if you are a sensitive individual and, and do have those respiratory issues, go with the... Uh, the bucket and soapy water method, that would probably be a lot better for you. Then what do you do with them when you, after you soak them? Uh, you can basically take them out and, and dump them in the woods away from the house and, and that should okay. be fine. Okay, um, so here's a question. Uh, if the city started a treatment program, i.e. spraying, clipping, et cetera, how many years should we continue to do this? Three to four years, a question, three or four years or less. Um, it's sort of situational. Um, I'm I'm hoping that this population will collapse the spring. It, it really is dependent on that spring weather. Um, so down coast from you guys in Bath and um, like the Cumberland, Freeport, Yarmouth area, that area has has had less uh, brown tail, uh, and it sort of moves through an area. It's in an area for a few years, and and don't get me wrong, they still have brown tail down there. Um, but it's not as bad as as Belfast um, and and that surrounding area. So it's sort of it's a tough question to to answer for sure. Um, very situational and very weather dependent, unfortunately. Yeah, we want a wet spring, right? <laughs> um, and thank you to Elizabeth Stanley for putting all the web um, links in the chat. She put the um, FAQs in there. So all, those of you might want to save them, click on them and save them. Um, we had a question here. Do any birds eat brown tail caterpillars? Um, I, so I don't think that. So one of the reasons why they have these uh, toxic urticating hairs is it's a defense against vertebrate predators. So against uh, rodents and, and, um, and birds. That being said, I have seen I have had a, a few reports of goldfinches sort of tearing at the webs um, and blue jays tearing at the webs. I don't know if they're necessarily getting any nutrition out of them or 
if it's more of a curiosity thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say generally the birds are, are not really going to eat them. So this question is um, about if this, uh, if the caterpillars can die in the winter, and I know you said they don't, but this person suggests that they saw a person in arborist go and try to clip um, the webs out and the nest had been, um, the caterpillars were all dead because the strong winter winds. Have you heard anything else about that? So I, I really doubt that it's actually been the, uh, been the cold weather. So if you think about it, they're at the very tips of the branches blowing around in the wind. That's where they've evolved to overwinter. And they have these antifreeze proteins uh, in their blood so that the ice forms on those proteins and, and doesn't damage their cells. Um, so it, it could be something else um, that's been affecting them, but it's probably not the cold weather. Um, okay, so we had some interest in the community web clipping events. If we organize such a thing, is there an entity that could loan a community some of those long clippers? Do you have any ideas on that? Um, I don't know. I know that there's some libraries that that actually rent out pole pruners um, for the community, mm -hmm. um, but I I think that's about the the apex yeah. of it. My library doesn't. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good idea. Somebody should do that. Um, uh, Karen made a comment that there's only one company in Maine who does spraying and that's Hawks or Hawk. Yeah. Other, I don't know if that's true, but all the other ones do plugs. If you have others, there might be resources on the webpage that name other place people. Do you know anything about that? Yeah. So we maintain a list of, uh, Arborists and pesticide applicators that are willing to do brown tail work, um, and you can find that on our our main Forest Service website. There'll be a, yep. Yep. a link under the resources. And another comment: Why hasn't the state stepped up to dedicate money to help residents with web clipping statewide? Yeah. So another question that I get quite a lot. Um, yeah. So a lot of the that if you think about the amount of people that are affected, that's a lot of uh, of money. A lot of the management is focused on on um, basically at the very local level, um, and there is actually a bill floating around the legislature right now. Actually, my boss gave testimony on it today, um, it, and that bill provides money. Um, it basically, provides a, a small fund to help subsidize um, uh, townwide. Uh, Townwide management, and uh, but it's it's not a lot of money. Uh, it's I think the pool of money is only one hundred fifty thousand dollars. And if you if you look at the city of Bangor, uh, I believe that their program was fifty thousand dollars. So that money is going to get eaten up um, pretty quickly. All right, I'm just uh, people kept adding so many questions, and I'm as we were just talking, I'm going through them. Um, so somebody says he wants to leave Maine next summer for one month. What what four weeks should he choose? August, right? <laughs> Can you take me with you? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, to get away from the moths, I guess. I don't understand the question. Um, yeah, so if you're going to, I would say that you're going to be out, out of Maine um, for a particular month. Uh, so probably the worst period for the caterpillars is from... Um, very late May uh, through through June. Um, usually the first or second week of July, they're done feeding, they turn into moths um, and are flying around and, and not causing as many issues. But June, late May, and very early July are, are the worst times for sure. Yep. And there's more questions about where to find resources, like the plugs to put in the trees. And you have all that information on the FAQs. I know people who have bought them on online and then um, returned them because <laughs> they didn't want to do it. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, so now I don't know if, I, let me see, if, if the caterpillars have crawled all over your wood pile, how should you handle your wood for your stove? Um, probably carefully, definitely wear long sleeves, gloves. Um, there's actually a, a guy that contacted me about two years ago, and um, 
he it was sort of a funny story he had he had a, a rash on his more tender parts and he was he was telling me about this and um he couldn't figure out why why that happened you know and basically what happened we figured it out he was going out to his wood pile to put wood in the sauna and he was doing that not clothed and and accidentally got the hairs on him that way um so definitely wear clothing but wear long sleeves and and gloves for sure um okay here's one about the emerald ash borer can ash trees be painted with anything to reduce incursions and is there a limit to how high on the tree the emerald ash borer will lay eggs um so the first question there's not really anything that you can um, paint they are some of the traps are this like purple fuchsia color and, and some of the traps are this green color um i wouldn't say that there's anything you can do to paint on the tree that would make it less attractive um one thing that people do if they have a very large uh specimen ash tree in their yard they, that, that they want to keep um they will do uh some tree injections i don't uh, I don't know the active ingredient for those um, injections, but it's sort of a, and, and even then you have to re-inject every, every other year, um, but there's nothing really to, to paint on there. Um, but emerald ash borer will attack and eat any, any place that there's cambium, anything from, um, you know, branches about you know, uh, inch or two in diameter, all the way right down to the root collar. Um, I think I had a, a photo on there of it right right down to the roots. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure you get this question all the time. What's the best treatment for the itching of the rash from the brown tail caterpillar? So technically I'm not allowed to give uh, medical advice because I'm not a <laughs> medical professional or anything like that, but um, some of the things that I've heard that help are uh, Benadryl, calamine lotion, witch hazel. Uh, a lot of the coastal pharmacies will whip up uh, a solve or concoction. I've heard that is sort of on the more expensive side. Um, I might suggest a nice boxed wine to maybe numb <laughs> the pain a little bit. Um, but there are, are a lot of creams and solves out there um, yeah. that, that work well. Yeah. Um, so this is an interesting question. Do the hairs get into the lake water? So swimming would increase one's risk of inflammation. Yeah, I got a few questions about that this past summer. Um, and when people first started contacting me about it, I was thinking it was more swimmer's itch, which is actually um, a very small organism that is looking for the feet of ducks. Um, it's a swimming larval phase that, and when it winds up in humans, um, your immune system reacts and, and causes this itching. But uh, through talking to some of these people, um, they it, it was more than likely uh, brown tail moth hairs that were laying on the the surface of the water. People jumped in, maybe got them on them, or as they're exiting the water, um, possibly got them on them, and then were drying off with a towel or grinding those hairs in. Um, so definitely possible. One thing I might uh, recommend if if you have access to uh, a hose is maybe to hose yourself off before you dry yourself off. Um, that might help. Um, but yes, it is, is certainly a problem. Yeah. And somebody just asked, are there restrictions about spraying um, for them around the waters? Probably yes. So like yes. state parks, like Lake St. George State Park had a huge outbreak the past two years. And um, I didn't see that they did anything. Yeah, so there's a there there are both restrictions for freshwater and in particular marine waters, and uh, those are all sort of detailed in in those frequently asked questions, but also on the board of pesticide control website. And um, so the marine waters are those buffers are set up to protect our marine fisheries, so lobster and shellfish and all all of that good stuff. Um, but there's also setbacks from um, freshwater as well. And a lot of people that uh, contact me that do have uh, freshwater waterfront property, uh, and there's you know these large majestic oak trees right on the the edge of the lake. One of the only options for them is to do injections, um, but definitely 
definitely check on the Board of Pesticide Control website and you'll find that information on those setbacks. All right, well, I've asked all the questions. I don't know if you wanna, um, if anybody else has a question, they might wanna raise their hand. Um, hold on, I gotta, I can't see people. <laughs> I have to uh, see the gallery view. If anybody has a question, please um, raise your hand. Um, there's a lot of information we just got, lots of good answers. I don't see anybody's hand. Uh, Andre, if you wanna. Oh, I, you see one. Oh yeah. Hi, hi. Um, I was just wondering, uh, I put the question in the chat, but I don't think it got asked. Um, what does the, uh, when, you, when a municipality declares or gets the CDC to declare the brown-tailed moth in their town, a public health nuisance, like Waterville did recently, I think a, couple, a year or two ago. Um, what does that do for the municipality? Does it do anything? Does it allow, I know it allows you to spend um, public money on, you know, on private land, um, you know, to, to dispense with the brown-tailed moth, but I don't know anything beyond that. That you basically summed it up. Um, it it basically allows the municipality to spend the public funds. A lot of people, um, a lot of people think that in you know declaring it a public nuisance frees up some some funding from the state, um, but unfortunately there there is none. Um, but yeah, so one of the other things that we did with a, a revamp to the website is we created something called the municipal battle book. And um, in, in it, it, it details many things, including a timeline of what town should be doing when and um, you know when to do certain activities, but it also has instructions and, and details what that uh, declaration of public nuisance is and um, it sort of walks through the instructions and stuff like that. Thank you. Okay, Jory, go ahead. Sometimes I'm one of these people that's very affected by this uh, per parasite. Uh, and sometimes you get the feeling that, that you've been exposed to it. You're getting the first, you just come back from swimming or just come back from doing something in the yard and you, you suspect that you, you've been exposed. Uh, and what's your best strategy at that point? <laughs> yeah. So take a bath and I'd, you know, I, what would, what would you do there? <laughs> Yeah, so I've, I've definitely been in that situation many times. And one of the things that I do is before, you know, like I said, um, remove the clothes, put them in the dryer at high heat. But for this, the hairs that might be on your skin, basically um, you'll want to take a, a cold shower. And the reason for the cold shower is because um, it, the cold water won't open up your pores and it will help rinse some of those um, hairs off. Another thing that I usually do when I come back from the field is um, either get like a, a lint roller or uh, some packing tape and maybe uh, pat down the areas of your skin that you feel might have been exposed. Um, and that will remove some of the hairs before they stick in. I see, I see. Thank you, thank you. No problem. Uh, let's see, does anybody else have a question? Tom, Tom, Tom King. You're, you're muted. Yeah, uh, Tom, just about both the brown tail moth and the MRI ash borer, uh, their mobility. Um, the brown tail moth, you said, is a hitchhiker and it, it grabs a ride with everybody. I mean, once it gets in an area, is it, does it, is it pretty well confined to that area? I mean, does it stay within that area? And with the MRI ash borer, does it move far or could you encompass an area and cut down all the ash trees and contain it? Uh, so with with uh, so with brown tail, uh, like the the hitchhiking that I mentioned and and was in the the presentation, that's that's a way for brown tail to really disperse very far. Um, so the males and females, the adult moths are very good at flying. They're they're very strong flyers. And actually one of my colleagues in Nova Scotia uh, contacted me and there's been moths that are 
are appearing in Nova Scotia adult moths. And what happens, and one of the reasons why you see brown tail expanding northward and not so much southward is that the prevailing winds are going north. So they will um, hitch a ride on the air currents as well um, and be blown off course or on course, depending on where they land. Um, so that's, that's sort of one way that they can disperse. Um, and like I said, there are really good flyers for Emerald Ash Borer. Um, again, the adults are very, very good flyers. Um, and natural dispersal is about two miles per year, which can be really accelerated if people are moving firewood or, or ash products um, in and out of that quarantine zone. Uh, so when I was out in, uh, <clears throat> when I was out in Illinois, uh, if anybody's ever been to East Central Illinois, it's flat, flatter. Uh, than a tabletop and it's all corn and soybeans and really the only trees are around people's houses or or in county parks and there's this ball field surrounded by miles and miles of corn and soybeans and uh, around this ballpark were these white ash trees completely infested with emerald ash borer um, so you can if it can find <laughs> ash trees in a, a cornfield like that uh, uh, a forest is an all-you-can-eat buffet, um, and they don't really have any trouble finding their hosts, unfortunately. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Anybody else? I guess not. I can't. I don't see any other hands raised. Well, thank you so much, um, Tom, for your time and your very thorough presentation and I re remind people to check out those um, links for their, your website um, and there's lots of FAQs and information there. So Thanks thank you again. Welcome. Thank no you. No problem. And if yeah. anybody has any further questions, feel free to reach out to me um, through phone or, or email. Email would probably be um, preferable. I'm just out uh, surveying a lot uh, these days, but um, definitely feel free to reach out with any questions. I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you.